Welcome up on stage, Khaled Abdu Mohamed Said. You're a journalist and former asylum seeker from Eritrea. You also work with the Association for Eritrean Asylum Seekers in Sweden. Uh, welcome up on stage also Michael Williams from the Swedish Church and FAR, which is a network of refugee support groups. Welcome up on stage uh, Shahram Koshravi from Stockholm University. Elin Landell from the Ministry of Employment. And Anne disappeared. No. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> Uh, except for Anne, which we just heard, I would like to ask uh, the others if you could just give us a brief presentation of why you are here today and uh, your perspective on this topic that we're discussing here today. Please. Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I have two minutes. Um, and I, I, um, um, I focus on the two, two key words in the title of this conference, integration and waiting. Um, honestly, I don't know what integration is. So, um, but, but if with integration we mean participation uh, and right to, to participate. So it was very interesting to hear today to, to speakers talk about rights and, and how these rights is available but not accessible. And this is interesting and important um, difference. Something is available but not accessible. We have so many rights, human rights, uh, and rights to participate, rights to work, etc. But how people are denied, how people are rejected, refused to participate, and their rights are rejected, discrimination, racism, of course, Mr. Uh, Jalen's testimony today was interesting to, to show us how, how he uh, and his, um, his, his wife try struggle every day to participate, but they were rejected day after day. Um, something else I want to say is about uh, uh, approach to, to integration should be long term. Maybe Denmark is very efficient in short-term integration for, for asylum seekers. But when we link it to long-term um, uh, approach, how people feel integrated and belong to that Danish society, we see a difference. We see how deny, denying asylum seeker today has impact on my integration who came to Sweden 25 years ago. We should have that in mind. Um, the second part of um, my reflection is on waiting. This is uh, something I'm trying to work on more. Waiting generates feeling of powerlessness and uh, invisibility. And with that comes a sense of vul vulnerability. In Western society, time is in term, we understand time in term of efficiency. It should be as used and time is associated with success and money. Speed, mobility, time is money. Uh, this is the ideal. But the concrete situation of asylum seeker is different. They cannot reach that, that success because they are in waiting. They are in prolonged waiting, and this imbalance between the goal and the means to reach these goals cause enemy, classic sociological. Um, and this enemy cause marginalization, sense of inferiority. It cause um, also, uh, uh, it has also results in weakening the ability of individual to connect oneself to the larger society. It generates a feeling of losing one's social function. It means that one feel has no sense of function in society, a sense of purposelessness and rolelessness. Um, and this also is about position in society. Asylum seeker left their own country, came here, but they are not fully in in society. They are liminal people. They are in liminal situation. And this liminality, which is linked to waiting, prolonged waiting, 
um, is very important because they are in between. They are in situation of between structures, between rules, between laws. Liminal persons are usually um, uh, understood to be in inferior position and are socially and economically marginalized. Um, so this waiting and liminality are very important and we have heard a lot about that today. People talk about that in different forms. Yes. And I, we I will think get back to the topic. Thank you very much. You. Elin Landel, please. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come here and comment on this um, interesting presentations. Um, I'm a director at the employment of uh, the, the, um, the uh, Ministry of Employment. Uh, but I'm here talking from uh, the uh, standpoint of, uh, of a public inquiry that I was heading, and we handed over the, um, the final report to the government in late October. Um, the right to participate is the, uh, the name in English. In Swedish, it's medrett uh, delta. And that is what it's all about. The focus is on women and family member uh, migrants, but of course it's the same message for everyone to have a right to participate. And I would, I would like to stress only one uh, very important finding to, to carry on the discussion here today. And that is what we found is that early action is key to the introduction process. Something has to happen fast. And as we, we use the data that's, uh, that's available and we try to control for other factors, we saw that waiting for, for employment-related measures matters significantly and strongly on the, the, uh, the chance of being employed if you measure it five years after you, you come to the country. Uh, for, for women, it uh, meant 35%, 31% lower likelihood of being employed five years after, after, after settling in the country if you wait three years for measures. At, and for men, it's even stronger. So it's very significant and it's very, um, it's, it's stronger than we actually thought. Um, and these results, of course, and if you go for the gender perspective, it's, it's important because women do get to wait longer. They stay behind. We haven't mentioned the differences between men and women here, but the fact is that if it's difficult for men to, to get into the labor market, it's twice as difficult for the women. And women have to wait longer, and they get less labor market um, uh, real measures. They don't get the same kind of measures when they do get measures from, the, from different, different actors. So these results, of course, it, it, call, it calls for effective and speedy processes first to decide if you have a right to stay. Of course, that process has to be as short as possible and as quickly as the permit is there both men and women must be given the chance to participate. Thank you very much. Michael Williams. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm here in a dual role as a member of an NGO that works with asylum seekers specifically, and then as a member of the Church of Sweden and working and employed in the diocese, where I work also with integration issues. <coughs> And I'm also a member of the Church, the Christian Council of Sweden's reference group on migration matters. Uh, in all these uh, contexts, we're very concerned about the growing isolation of asylum seekers. We heard Esther <coughs> tell us what has been deducted in the last year or so, which was one of the more positive aspects of Swedish asylum reception. No instruction in Swedish, no civic education, no organized activities and just handing over a vacuum to NGO or church initiatives. These are taking place, but not coordinated, and more efforts need to be made to fill the gap uh, there if we are going to see integration as something that starts from day one. 
Right now, we have a very high uh, admission uh, rate. It's over 40%. So four out of every 10 persons here has a high likelihood of being able to stay. We're also concerned about the lengthy proceedings. Eskil explained that with more people coming, it takes more time. And even those who have uh, permanent residence permits are now staying in their uh, asylum-seeking uh, accommodation up to six months, and nothing happens. They don't get going. They, they at last get permission to stay, and they don't see any change. They live on the same low rate of remuneration until they are accepted by a municipality. Yesterday, a family of four moved to Fallon, and they have had to survive on 6,200 crowns per month, in spite of the fact that they have a right to Swedish family allowance. It will be paid retroactively. We see lack of synergies in the administering systems, which must be addressed. Uh, some of those have been raised by political parties recently, suggesting that the teaching of Swedish should be taken over by the, um, uh, the labor uh, board and Arbetsförmedling uh, in order not to have this uh, unfortunate gap. We're also concerned about people who are here who cannot leave or do not want to leave. They are a growing number of people. They're growing desperate. I know people in my hometown in Hedemura who've been in Sweden for 10 years. Their lives are just dissipating away and we do nothing. We can't send them back but we have rules that say every person must leave Sweden themselves. In the past, we took into account whether it was possible to send them or not, regardless of who the fault was. Now we put the blame on the asylum seeker, and we have people, more and more people here for many more years going through the system twice or three times. Uh, we also uh, see a need for better cooperation between the NGOs and authorities. I myself have proposed to the Migration Board, everywhere you have reception centres, encourage the municipalities to have reference groups which take on NGOs, immigrants organisations, humanitarian organisations, so that we're in on the discussion, because we're all part of any integration policy. The Church of Sweden is everywhere in Sweden, so we are a giant, a silent giant, but well, we're not silent, we're very active in many places, but we have growth potential uh, there. Um, we must also be aware that integration, perhaps, is not the goal for everyone. An asylum seeker who actually is, has his case uh, um, approved may dream of wishing to return to his home country as soon as possible. We have to uh, say that you, know, you can live a life in Sweden for two or three years and return and do other things here uh, that are beneficial for you here, but also on your return. Uh, we need also good context with religious leaders throughout the country uh, because in the meetings of cultures these people can play an important role in uh, both directly towards their own community but also between the religious communities. And we could also open up Sweden to more work placements. In one church in my diocese they have a program where for one month an asylum seeker goes to the parish and is with everyone there in turn, following them in their work. They hardly know any Swedish at all, but it has psychological and cultural advantages. And many more workplaces could think, how could we open up our workplace to people just for them to get linguistic and cultural competence, not that they wish to train in the job. I've got 10 more points, but no time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please, Khaled Abdul Mohamed yeah. Said. Thank you for inviting me here. And I'm here uh, representing Association of Eritrean Asylum Seekers, where we work at having the experience, recent experience, <coughs> being asylum seeker and being in the process of integration. And the first impression I got was like, why wait? When we have the, the title, waiting for integration, why wait? Why should I wait to integrate? And previously, we were criticizing the quality of uh, Swedish uh, courses everywhere, SFE, from the migration worker to all the other SFE programs. Now, even that which was criticized, the quality, is not there. I mean, as long as someone is waiting for his decision in the asylum process and not having access to Swedish language, how are we expecting that these people would be able to work and we are talking about giving them work permit. So for me, first impression is lasting. The first thing one finds in the process is like one is valueless. You don't have any value. 
You just sit with an alphabet and you have to Swedishize everything of you. For me, knowledge has no color, no ethnicity, nothing. Knowledge is knowledge. So if I have knowledge that I can help with that, my own countrymen, why should I wait until others help me? And the initiative we took was, we observed one thing here. As individual, you are nothing almost. I mean, you just get to, and uh, you are in touch with the case officer, and the case officer himself has no role to decide. He's only following his routine and just following everything. You have to approach the decision makers. To approach them, you have to get organized. We organized ourselves. We could do a lot as an association representing the asylum seekers. In the process, I want to thank you, Swedish Church, Svenska Kirchkan, and Sudi Framjandet, which I still argue for the civic society having role in the process. Why should we wait until migrants work at fixes his problems? Why not other actors do their role and help people start integrating? Why should I wait for someone else until they are aware of it? Now we are having some illness orientary for those who have got put. Why not for those asylum seekers? The same process is in their mother tongue. Some less orientation is being so civic orientation is being given to those who have residence permit in their mother tongue. As long as it's in their mother tongue, why shouldn't we do it for the asylum seekers through the other actors which are already available? So, as Michael said, I observe one thing: every authority in Sweden is working as its own government. There is no coordination among them. Migrants were giving a black image of Sweden. Integrants workers try to lift you up, but you have already lost your confidence. It's the self-confidence that one should have always. If you lose your confidence, if you feel in the process that you are valueless, then it's very, very difficult. It takes only hours to destroy one's self-confidence, but it takes years to get it back. So the first impression is lasting. And it's there in the migration process one has to feel that he can still help. Why should, be I, why should I be helped in something which I can? The process makes you feel like you are a child and you have to be taught everything and whatever you have been doing is <coughs> valueless. So we need to invest there. We have to catch them early to make them feel like they are still with value what they had before they come here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, want to, I want to go back to the very interesting story of uh, Alio, uh, who told us that he's been in Germany for so many years and he only uh, was allowed visa uh, every three months. How come the society puts up so many obstacles for people who are newcomers and who wants to be a part of society? I mean, we heard you, Elin, you talked about, uh, and Emil, the reception system is uh, about to equip newcomers. Uh, we heard about the Swedish Arbetslinjen work first. So how come the reality is so different from the aims? Please, Michael. I think you have to take into account differences between countries and traditions. Germany was known in migration policy as the place that just had guest workers. There is a kind of temporality in the German uh, approach to migration, not so much integration. Uh, we could also say that in, in your case, Aliu, if you'd been in Sweden, you wouldn't even have got temporary permission. You'd just been waiting in, in the uh, accommodation until something else might happen. Uh, the German system perhaps is slightly more humane, giving people some uh, rights when they cannot be removed at that point in time. Uh, but uh, the, you know, the, the, the asylum system is fairly strict. It's there to select people who are truly in need of protection. The national rules have now been coordinated but not harmonized at the European Union level. And uh, I think in one way, better information to asylum seekers on how tough it is would be uh, better than finding out over a long period of time that this is almost an inaccessible uh, place. Uh, people are lucky from time to time. The church was involved in the Easter uh, appeal here in 2005, 2006. 17,000 people were allowed to stay who had recently re uh, been refused. But you cannot build a long-term migration policy on the hope <coughs> that something will break, as it were, and you, you make a temporary. <coughs> and in that way, I think that 
we could do more, both from NGOs and from the authorities, to give serious, objective information about the requirements to be able to stay. I'm not saying that I agree with those requirements, but anyone in the legal situation they're in is, I think, better off if you know the harsh facts than if you believe something will happen which might not happen and often doesn't. Elin, what are your views on it? And then Anne. Uh, I just want to stress this about differences be between countries. Uh, we don't have the same system as Germany. And um, actually, if you get uh, asylum status, so to say, you're granted a, perm a permanent um, stay in Sweden. You don't get three months. But of course, it's um, as you say, it can take time any way before you start in your integration process. That I don't say. But the, the, the situation with three months visiting permit without the right to, to work, that's not the case in Sweden. You get a permanent residence um, permit uh, as a general rule. And you wanted to come in here uh, about the reason why. Yeah. Oh, you have your own microphone. You can keep it. Yes, please. Well, <laughs> no, I think that's okay. Um, about the reason why uh, people have to wait. Uh, first, if you take different, I mean, different cultures. Could in you Europe, please? Uh, yes, in Europe. For the recording. There are many countries in Europe which uh, do not have integration policies or vision for even for their own citizens. Uh, and, and so, of course, newcomers uh, fall into, into that case. If you look at uh, Italy, I would take the extreme case of uh, Greece, but these, um, it, it, these are structural uh, issues. <clears throat> and so, in, in many countries, integration is a new debate. Uh, then why people have to wait when they arrive from a state perspective, it's very logical. It's because they have to wait until the state will decide if they have the right or not, as you mentioned, to stay. And the uh, tolerated status in Germany uh, is one of the way <coughs> how <coughs> states solve the issue of people they cannot remove, but uh, they, they, they also do not grant uh, a legal status. Uh, I, I would just add the fact that, uh, for me, the problem is also that people have to stay, uh, to wait, uh, but even worse, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say even worse, but uh, states put some ex obstacles um, already at the arrival, like detention, uh, detention which undermines for, for a long time uh, any integration prospects. And I remember having received at ACRE a letter from uh, um, a refugee woman uh, who got finally a status in Malta but remained eight months in detention. And she was clearly saying it's, it's a stigma. I, I do not dare going to people or because I feel like a little bit like the uh, discussion about rape uh, I feel like I'm, I'm isolated because I was detained. So somehow, if I'm detained, I'm a criminal. And, and so all <coughs> NGOs and all actors, including uh, municipality and localities, have to compensate uh, these, these policies which actually destroy people. Uh, I wanted to come back to what you said, Shahram, about long-term uh, integration, and uh, it also has to do with your perspective and the very pessimistic perspective that EU is not an actor for change. Uh, do you think that the politics are able to focus on long-term integration uh, if you try to be realistic, because politics yeah. are often short-term? So. Yeah, in, if it's not, what do you think is needed? Integration has two sides. One side is participation, to be able to participate in labor market, in socially, politically, culturally. The other side of integration is sense of belonging. Do I, I, I have work, I have good salary, I have uh, more Swedish friends than Iranian friends, uh, I represent Sweden in internationally, international conferences, uh, I, am I integrated? Honestly, I cannot answer that question because my sense of belonging to this country 
has been uh, denied, has been refused uh, uh, time to time. Um, so what is long-term integration? Yeah, like th this is what I'm saying, that, that integration is not a simple movement of going in from outside. And when you are inside, that's finished. Yeah, you should see, I have seen in my research that how people who have been uh, felt integrated in Sweden after years, they are less integrated. They feel less integrated. So this is what I'm saying. Integration is not one single movement. It's dynamic. It's people go in and come out. You know, and, and this is what I mean with long-term integration and how integration policies is linked to migration policies. How we close borders today has impact on integration on, of those who came yesterday. Denmark is a very good example. How the, uh, in, in, their migration policies can have bad impact, negative impact on integration of those who have been there. So this is what I mean with long-term integration. Uh, you talk about the policies of Denmark, but we heard earlier that uh, there might be some uh, pros uh, when we compare Malmö and Aarhus, uh, where asylum seekers cannot choose where they want to live. I, I would like to ask you, uh, Khaled, from your perspective, do you think that a, remov a removal of the Swedish EBO system would be better? I don't think it's better because uh, in the whole process, what I notice always is w people who come from collective society, collective somehow like Africa and Middle East, they often tend to believe word of mouth. They are countrymen than the official information canal from the government. So for them, it's not the geographic importance where they live. It's the people around, where, around whom they live, which is important. That's why we have problem. I'm working now in Arbis for Mele. Whenever you are meeting uh, a newcomer, you will see like telling you how it was in the 80s and 90s. And you are telling him about the new reform and now it's like this and that. No, they have already informed. So this EBO is for them a kind of trick head, a kind of security. Having, because as, as Shahram said, you have to feel belong, belong, you have to belong to something. The problem is, I always wonder when, when professors use the term Andhra Generations in Vandrara. Second generation Second immigrants. Second generation refugees. In Vandering, isn't that someone has came? How can he use it to someone who is born here? So how can he feel belong to this society if you are naming him as a refugee coming from outside when he didn't? So there are things that are already implanted that makes you feel you belong to those who are in Iubo, not Abo. I don't have to be placed in, I, I was in Guluspong myself. It was very difficult to, to get someone to talk to. So I was a football player, I started football, then I get some friends in football. That was the only way to come in. So for me, Ibo, as, as, as someone put it, is a natural option. You need someone who talks your language. We rely on talk. Who is going to do the cultural talking, the cultural translation? It's not only the language we have to translate. We have to translate how these people are getting the information we are giving. Is that we don't care, we just give information and let them to translate it the way they want it. So Igbo is very important for the people coming because for them that is a formal, formal for them. For me, it was my countrymen who gave me directives, information, not the official, can, official information canal. So it's very important for them. And you can't, you can't, even if you come with regulations stopping that, they will have other means to get it. OK, thank you. We have a question from the audience. Hi, Chris Redman is my name. And I have a question to you. Uh, can we take care of the immigrants better? So we see their knowledge uh, as something which is useful instead of always talking about how they can change. Yes, Michael. 
I think we have to differentiate between a, a media discussion and the concepts there and what's actually happening at ground level. There are lots of immigrants whose talents are recognized. There are lots of immigrants who are making progress with their lives here in Sweden, but those stories are seldom told. Uh, I, I came here as a love migrant uh, many years ago, and I'm still around, and uh, I've also had my knocks, but uh, you know, it's a very privileged country in general to be an immigrant in, and I think that there are lots of signals saying, yeah, you, you're welcome to be part of it. We can vote after three years residence. There are lots of sort of uh, political rights, and I, I think in this discussion we should look at both aspects there. Uh, I think it's, it's difficult to integrate in Sweden. Often the Somali case is compared internationally, UK, US. Why is it such a problem in Sweden? And I think also that all of us have to be more curious about the people who are coming here and show a real human interest in their presence. Uh, as Khalid said, the psychological aspect of being forced to move from one country to another is very debilitating. And if you meet friendly, curious people, that can help you a long way. Uh, just somebody who says hi to you the first month you're in Sweden uh, can make your day and your week compared with just passing by and nobody recognizing you. So I think we should look at the psychological aspects of human interaction in general. It's just welcoming the stranger. And we have a lot of that in our own basic values, but we need to be better at practicing it collectively. I think also we have to be better at being Swedish teachers for people who are struggling to learn the language and make more effort to understand what they're saying, get lots more Studieverbund uh, educational associations involved in doing what they did for the Swedish people before. We have to do now for a new group of people who also have a lot of knowledge but need to add to it with the special bits that make it relevant for you to stay on in Sweden. So I, I would say that the debate generally doesn't reflect reality, and we've seen a couple of reports the last two days that point in another direction. It's complex, but there are lots of good things out there too. Uh, I would like to ask you, and you talked about a shift. Uh, more, we talk more and more about integration requirements, and it's a new discourse. So connected to the question we heard from the audience, uh, why, why does this shift happen? I mean, it can be very stigmatizing to talk about requirements because you give a signal that um, that the newcomers need requirements, otherwise they can't uh, be a part of our society. Why do we see this shift? I think someone, I think it was you, um, actually gave the answer, or one face of the answer. Um, it's the link between uh, integration policies and, and migration policies. And in the political discourse at national level, I think in all European countries, uh, but also, of course, at the EU level, the EU level uh, reflects what's going on at national level. Um, this is the same discourse. It's like uh, we need to, to restrict migration channels. And uh, one way to restrict is to uh, hire um, the uh, the level of requirements or the number of requirements, and then uh, and then and then you you if you read the uh, all the legislation not only in asylum actually in for some for some points refugees are more protected than than other uh, groups of migrants, but if you read all this legislation, it's very clear. Uh, if I take just family reunification. It's very clear that all the requirements are not uh, established to facilitate the reunification of families, but to select and to actually uh, restrict the family reunification channel because it's it's uh, uh, known uh, from member states as the the the, the last uh, main channel legal channel for for people to to come. Shaharam, you wanted uh, the word, and then we will have time for a few more uh, questions from the audience. I, I pass, so OK, pass. pass. Please go ahead, and please wait for the microphone. Yes, Erika will bring it to you. Hi. My name is Jabufu. I'm what the gentleman called the second generation immigrant. <laughs> um, I just have a very uh, curious sort of question around when it comes to um, not just immigration and 
integration, but also from the perspective of ac acceptance from you know, the Swedish country and the countrymen here, how we, from an employment perspective, can get more refugees or people from other countries um, into the job market. So I'm wondering, are there any initiatives that look at that and perhaps our attitude towards getting people into the job market? Do you know of any projects or studies that, that focus on that? Because I think it's a double-edged sword. It's not just about the process of getting people into the country and integrating them here, but it's also about, as you said, accepting them in, into particularly the employment market. So I'm wondering whether are there any initiatives to look at that and our attitudes towards getting them in. Elin, I guess you could answer the question. <laughs> Okay. Um, of course, uh, it's been uh, the sound uh, proof of uh, that, that there is discrimination in the labour market towards, uh, towards, uh, for instance, immigrants, but also towards other groups. I must say, um, and in within the labour market policies, it shouldn't really be be uh, addressing certain groups, but individual needs apart from the first years as a, if you just if you're a recently arrived then you have special measures otherwise it should be the individuals needs and it doesn't matter if you're if you're an immigrant or if you're a disabled person or whatever is the cause of you having a problem in the labor market but of course discrimination exists and but I wouldn't say that it's stronger in Sweden than in other countries. So, I mean, you have to work on both sides. You have to work on, on, uh, on uh, um, also attitudes, of course. Also, as we saw in our um, inquiry, attitudes at the, at the uh, administrator's level, because it's also attitudes within the Arbetsförmedling, the labor market authority, or the, com the, the local communities towards different people. Hmm. Shall I'm very short, and then we have a last yeah. question from the audience. Um, I think, uh, yeah, but answering your question that there, there, is, there are studies showing to find jobs, not only for immigrants and refugees, but also for Swedes, what important component is, is, is social capital, as Professor, uh, I'm sorry, I... Louis Henri Sequa? Yes, uh, mentioned earlier today, ca capitals are important, and one important capital here to find job in Sweden is social capital, your network, what kind of connections you have to find housing, work, etc. And if you are waiting, if you are in position of waiting, if you are in a position of liminality, so you don't have a good capital, social capital. You don't have that network which is necessary to, 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 to push you into to the labor market. OK, uh, we've already passed uh, our time, but we can, we can have one more last question from the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Haibe Hussein. Uh, I'm a coordinator for a group called Health Advisors in Stockholm County Council. Um, for your curiosity, I'm Somali of origin. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, before that, a comment. Been in Sweden for quite some time now, and um, I think there has been a lot of uh, progress, a lot of uh, modification with regard to different uh, authorities, uh, the Swedish Immigration Board, the um, Labor and Employment uh, Ministry uh, with regard to uh, facilitation of integration and, and um, uh, reception of asylum seekers. Um, when it comes to uh, labor, um, there's been this temporary um, permit for asylum seekers to, to get work. When it comes to uh, uh, immigration uh, board, there's been some facilitation as well. Educational uh, aspects like Swedish, there's been some modification as well. But the general notion is that there is uh, so much to be done. Uh, things seem still to be um, too little, too late 
uh, for many immigrants, especially special groups like the Somalis, which in the media we hear quite often that they're being marginalized. A lot ca can be done. There is a lot to be done still in that aspect. Uh, when it comes to this aspect of family reunification, there's been some structural uh, uh, obstacles uh, that is systematic, that's being shifted now and changed. But uh, quite often communities, especially among Somali groups, there's a question why, you know, why uh, families that, why members of families that has been um, given asylum or, or, or permit to stay are denied to get their, their family members, their, their husbands, wives, and, and kids to bring on the grounds that the Somali identity cards are not valid. This is so, seems so politically so incorrect, but uh, I'm glad that's changed. So the labor market, there is so much to change still. You know, it's more of a comment here and, and than a question. Uh, I think there is, is so much to be done. That's all I want to say. I don't want to take so much more time. Okay. So do we have a last comment to that uh, last comment from the audience? Yes, Michael. Uh, <coughs> Regarding family reunification, one of the problems to Somalis is getting money for the ticket. The Red Cross has run out of money now. I work in the church. I get phone calls every day. Can you help us? So we have people with permission to come to Sweden who can't come. Uh, and I have a proposal there, CSN, as you all know. Uh, they uh, administer a system for borrowing money to furnish your house. I want to suggest tomorrow at a meeting that they also have a system where you can borrow money to bring your family here because there are so many people who are delayed unnecessarily because the people here can't borrow money, they can't earn money uh, as I don't know, lack of integration, lack of job opportunities. Uh, and then one more disappointing thing about the European Union, to complement what Anne said, those asylum seekers who have had a first decision before the nine months have gone by, they will not be allowed to work. So the system is highly restrictive, even though it looks as if they're opening up on paper. And why? Then we can perhaps ask each other, who is a human being? And what rights do we have? Do we have human rights or do we have citizen rights only? Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have more time to elaborate.